Good morning and welcome to the Cube. Today on Spotlight, a conversation with two of Western Michigan University's best ambassadors. First, the university's new president, Dr. Ed Montgomery, a well-respected economist, educator, and former auto czar. And later, Detroit entrepreneur and author, Dr. Bill Picard, chairman of Global Automotive Alliance. He's getting ready for a major celebration and community challenge. It's Sunday, June the 17th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight from the Cube. We recently caught up with Dr. Montgomery on this side of the state. At the request of longtime Plymouth lawyer John Stewart, he spoke to an attentive crowd at the downtown Plymouth Arts and Recreation Complex. Will you kindly please give a little exercise with me and give standing ovation to our keynote speaker today, President Edward Montgomery. And then things that parents care about. The most affordable, high-quality institution in Michigan. We're ranked that. One of the 100 most impactful institutions, universities in the country by uh, Washington Monthly. That is, what do we do to students in terms of creating opportunities for them? And where do we like them? as a place to work for a magazine on a size size employers? Better than a place called Principles. You've taken over the helm of Western Michigan University, those Broncos. Uh, big picture. What's your goal? What do you want to accomplish? You know, it, it's a great opportunity to come and be part of this university, which has a rich tradition. What I'd like to do is keep that tradition, keep the things that ma made it special in terms of the quality of programs and the connection with the students and the people, and just take it to the next level. You've had so many different experiences uh, in education, outside of education, and you've been around the country at different universities. Um, what pleases you about higher education these days? You know, I think for, for individuals and for us collectively, higher education matters like it never has mattered before. It is really the key to opening opportunity for us as individuals. It's the key to opening uh, and strengthening our economy. It's the key uh, to our nation uh, being able to have citizens who are engaged and, and, and enrich our, our culture and our lives. And so being part of that, if you want to be part of a job where you can wake up every, every day and say, am I making an impact? The answer in higher ed is absolutely you are. And conversely, what worries you about higher education these days? So it, it faces some challenges. Uh, one of the first challenges it faces is affordability. How to make sure that the doors of opportunity can remain open, not just for those who come from wealthy families or are well-to-do, but for everybody. And access, I think, is, is a real key. And then the second thing for me personally is making sure that we at higher education deliver on that promise, that we help and make sure that we work with students to graduate, make sure they get their degrees, make sure that they're launched on that road to success, not just coming in the door, but make sure they graduate on the other side. How do we make the economics of education work? Education is, is like infrastructure. Uh, and we need it not just for today, but we need it for the future. Uh, and you could ignore your road today, uh, but eventually it'll need to be repaired or you can't drive down it. You can ignore higher education today or not invest in it today, but eventually you won't have the workers that you need, you won't have the new products you need, and your companies won't be competitive. So this is an investment. It's an investment that will pay off for us individually as citizens, and it's an investment that will pay off for us collectively. And so that's what I want people to focus on. It will pay off in so many different dimensions in terms of enhancing our earning potential, enhancing the strength of our economy, enhancing us as citizens, enriching our society. And that's uh, something that's worth spending some money on. Where do you see the trend going in terms of the type of education that students are getting, the type of courses that they'll need to be able to be successful, graduate, and get jobs, and be relevant to our society? Well, you know, overall, college graduates are doing really well, almost no matter what they, they major in. And so, you know, the unemployment rate for college graduates is like 2%. Uh, so there are jobs, there are opportunities uh, on a whole range of majors. Where do we see enrollments growing most? They typically are growing in the STEM fields, the science, the engineering, the technical fields. They're growing in the business fields. They're growing in the health occupations. And those are sort of the areas where there's most growth. 
But you know, a good education, a good college education, not only gives you those technical skills that you need for the job, but also prepares you how to think and how to deal with people and how to communicate and those things which are soft skills which come from other parts of the curriculum. So you gotta make sure that people are ready and tooled up as they say, but you also gotta make sure they're ready for the future uh, and for change. Uh, and that comes from a broad curriculum. Are our universities welcoming to immigrants and people coming in from other countries the way we have been in the past, or do you see changes there that concern you? So I, I'm concerned that we as a nation are not as welcoming uh, to immigrants as we had, or that we have sent a signal that we're not. And what where we've seen at higher education institutions is enrollments uh, from international students have dropped over the last couple of years. That so should be a worrisome trend because having access to the best talent, producing the best students, producing uh, the, getting the best professors, producing the best professors, no matter where they were born, is really key to our education system, our country being as strong as it can be. Uh, and so we shouldn't close the door. We should be about opening the doors of opportunity. And when Spotlight returns, Dr. Montgomery talks about the auto industry and politics. We'll be right back. Um, I mentioned earlier your economic background and being an economist. As you look at the American economy, your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think uh, objectively, if you look at many of the indicators, the economy has been going along pretty well. Uh, you've got an unemployment rate uh, that's uh, below 4%. Uh, you've got GDP is continuing to grow. We've been in a protracted expansion starting 2009, uh, and that continues. The stock market uh, is looking good. A couple of worrisome uh, trends uh, that you would want to be paying attention to, or three. First, uh, we still haven't seen wages for the average worker tick up like we should have. Mm -hmm. uh, are they sharing in the prosperity? Are they sharing uh, in terms of rising standards of living uh, for the average worker? That's, that still hasn't come back around like it should. Second trend we worry about uh, is trade. Uh, are we becoming engaged in trade wars? Uh, do we have to worry about that? Because international trade, that international trading system, has brought lots of prosperity to us as a country and as a globe. And so we need to understand it, manage it, but we don't, don't want to withdraw from it uh, as a proposition. And the third thing we need to worry about from an economic indicator thing is what's happening with the size of our deficits and our debt. Uh, are we borrowing too much money? Uh, and particularly at the federal level, uh, because that will come back and have implications in the future in terms of interest rates, our ability to invest uh, in, in other projects. Are you worried that the United States is becoming too much of an isolationist country? So, I, you know, I don't want to overreact to what's said as opposed to what's been done. Uh, and I think you want to be mindful of, of those distinctions, but mm -hmm. uh, to the degree we are signaling that engagement in the world uh, economically, uh, culturally, and all those other ways is not part of what we are, that's a worrisome trend. I think what part of what made America great, part of what made it a leader uh, for the last 50, 60, 70 years since World War II in, in the world is that we were actively engaged and, and telling our story and being a leader on a whole range of fronts as, as a country. So. Uh, I, I am worried. Uh, there's not, uh, NAFTA hasn't uh, been undone. The people have talked about it, but it hasn't been undone. Mm -hmm. TPC was, I, I think, a lost opportunity from my perspective. There were, there were problems with the treaty, but I thought it was a, a lost opportunity. We'll see how the China negotiations You think a lot of this is just sort of a political posturing? Well, I think there's a lot of political posturing going oh. on. Uh, what we'll see is whether it turns out what the substance uh, comes out of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, the president uh, is taking a different tact in his negotiations. Uh, he's, he's been a good ne negotiator uh, in other realms. Uh, it's a bit unorthodox. Um, and so the key is the rest of the world's not waiting. 
Uh, and so while we pulled out of TPC, for instance, China has been growing in its influence. Uh, and so what I worry, as I, when I talked about international students not coming here, it's not like they're staying at home. They're going to Canada. They're going to Australia. They're going to other parts of the world. So while we are figuring out what our strategy is or, or whatever it is we're engaged in, the world's not stopped. And so we don't want to get too far behind or lose the opportunity of somebody else become the dominant. Want to be respectful of your time. A couple more questions. As the former former auto czar and one of the key architects, many people would say, of helping to save the American auto industry, uh, your thoughts now that the crisis is over with, the auto industry appears to be very healthy, making money. Um, where are we at today and where are we headed? Well, you know, if for those who, who lived through 2008, 2009, 2010, and saw those dark days, uh, it's a remarkable transformation. Uh, the, both uh, GM and Chrysler, uh, Ford, the American auto companies, but the whole industry, the uh, uh, supplier base uh, is coming back in a, at a level that is, is really kind of remarkable and very, very gratifying to have played any role in, in, in that, that turnaround. Uh, so I think it's in, a, it's in a good position. But you know, in business, you're only as good as uh, what you've done today. And so uh, you can't sit on your laurels. You have to continue to come up with new and better product. You got to make sure you work on quality. Uh, you have to work on uh, the industry being able to react to change and, and where markets are. And so uh, it's gratifying that they've come. Uh, I'm optimistic for the future, but the future is not guaranteed. Uh, but I'm confident there are a lot of really talented people in those companies and in that industry and, and I think that they've got a bright future. Finally, uh, if you had to send a message to Western Michigan University alumni, what would it be? That their, their campus uh, is uh, changing, but it's keeping that essential uh, set of values that they remember. That se essential set of values that saw them as individuals where people were trying to help you get to the next level, take you further, uh, open doors. Uh, and that's what the campus is about, looking how do we do that for each successive generation. All right, President Montgomery. Thank you very much Thank for you so me. much for taking time out of your very busy schedule and best of luck at Thank you. WMU. Great to be here. All right. And coming up, Detroiter Dr. Bill Picard. We'll be right back. You got a big celebration coming up, a whole weekend full of activities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're saying thank you. Why? Yeah. Why, why, why now? Well, you know, um, my journey, I think, could not have taken place in any other city in America except Detroit. You just visualize being one of the first black owners in McDonald's mm -hmm. in 1971 and coming to this great city and all of the things that were going on here, whether it was Coleman Young, Martha Jean, the Queen, and the plethora of black-owned businesses that used to go up and down Livernois and Grand River. And I was a part of that. And I was able to see it as a young lad. And to see the transition of the city was also of interest. You just sold your last McDonald's. Uh, at, at your height, how many McDonald's did you have? Uh, off and on, I think we have had 12. We okay. still have one more. To sell. Still have one more to one, sell. Okay. Um, to operate. I don't want to, to say to sell. <laughs> All right. To <laughs> operate. Part of this celebration, part of it will be at the Rooster Tail. Yes. Uh, part of it will be at Orchestra Hall. Yes. Part of it will be a picnic in which I understand you are inviting all of your past yeah. employees. Yes. Yes. Of, of the McDonald's or? or <laughs> McDonald's. Or, or, of McDonald's. Yes. That's Can, a lot of I mean, people. Just think about it. Our first restaurant was at... Uh, West Warren, a little near, near Livernois, mm -hmm. and we were right down the street from uh, Murray Wright High School. And over the years, you know, young men and young ladies who came to work when they were 16, 17, some are doctors, some are law. Judge Greg Mathis worked for us, and he's coming back to be the In MC. the McDonald's? Yes. I didn't know yeah, that. Are you yeah, kidding yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, the judge. <laughs> At that time, he, he just. He was probably the sharpest dressing <laughs> employee yeah. within McDonald's, if by I know. A, group. By a long shot. <laughs> okay. And uh, he's just blown up to become an international celebrity, but he's coming home to spend the weekend with us. It's almost unbelievable that, at best, a, a C student could come to this place 
work hard like all of us do, but to have the different people, whether it was Dr. Arthur L. Johnson or whether it was Dr. Francis Cornegay, like Dr. Cornegay introduced me to Mr. Henry Ford. I mean, these kinds of things of life lessons, you know, how did I go become a part of Ronald Reagan's transition team? Well, Mel Larson took me to Uncle Max, Max Fisher. Max Fisher picks up I the phone it, Uncle Max. <laughs> and called Jim Baker. And I'm on the transition team for Ronald Reagan. And that really gave me another whole perspective of the world, not only America, but the world indeed. You, you also as you've said, been politically active. Uh, the NAACP has been near and dear to your heart, whether it was in the early days in Cleveland, mm -hmm. Ohio, or it was here in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, you remain committed to that kind of social justice. Without a doubt. Uh, I tell everyone I'm just a social worker who's been able to operate and be a part of a couple of businesses. But my basic value system, I think, was horned in that small hamlet of LaGrange, Georgia, and then Flint, Michigan, and especially Cleveland. Because when I arrived in Cleveland to work for the Urban League as a young lad with a social work degree, I saw black men and women working with white corporations, owning restaurants, owning businesses, owning beer distributorships, and I'd never seen anything like that. And of course, I met Mr. W.O. Walker. Yeah, who owned about eight or ten newspapers throughout the state of Ohio, and he was a great Republican. Yes, he and, was. And Arnold Pinckney, these people changed my life. I want to talk about some special things that you are doing and that you are challenging others to do in terms of philanthropy and giving back. Thank you. We'll be right back with Dr. Picard. Stay with us. given a lot of money, but you're now challenging others to give as well, and you say, you do it, and I'll, I'll match you in some areas. Yeah. Why? Well, the Motown Museum Historic Project is very important to all of us uh, throughout America, but especially in Detroit. And uh, my good friend Jimmy Settles uh, and I were chatting one night, and he asked for some money. Okay. Well, Jimmy, I don't have any money, you know that. All right, but, retiring UAW yeah, president, yeah, yeah, retire, vice president. Yeah, and, yeah. My, and my dear friend. And I said, but i tell you what I do, Jimmy. I will uh, pledge a million dollars to the Motown Historic Museum if you can get black folk, black churches, black community, black business people to match it. And that's what we're doing Sunday night. We're making the first uh, major installation on my pledge, and the churches are they stepping up to the yes, plate? Yes, yes, we've had some very, very good response. Uh, I think Jimmy Settles is the right person at the right time to make the appeal to our community and our churches. And uh, I feel very good about the pledge and the challenge. Doc, why has education in history been so important to That's, you? That has been the essence of what I was afforded in Flint, in Detroit, and in America. Um, I think... Because you're also an investor in the Michigan Chronicle oh, and, the, yeah, yeah. and some of the other St. Yeah, Stack the, the, papers. Yeah, and but so he, but he journalism is, yeah. is part of you, your belly wig. But remember, at 26 years of age, I met the W.O. Walker, who had probably eight or ten newspapers throughout the state of Ohio. And those kinds of things just resonated with me as I got older. And how do we protect these jewels? Because I would argue that the Pittsburgh Courier, and the Chicago Defender were the drum majors for the migration from the South to the North. And the fact that we have those under our ownership, and it has been uh, not a major success profitable, but we have kept them in the community and we have stayed true to the mission of those papers. You mentioned earlier that you're working on a new book. Uh, have a title for it yet? Is, well, it, is it done or are you still no, working on it? No, it's in the oven. But the, work, the <laughs> working the title oven. is 100 Amazing Black History Facts That We All Should Know from 1850 to 1950. And the challenge here, of course, is that we oftentimes think that business has been something foreign to our community. But in spite of all the challenges we had, slavery, discrimination, segregation, lynching, we still had men and women 
who are carving out a way to succeed in business. And I want to highlight some of that so that the present generation and future generations know that if Madam C.J. Walker became a multimillionaire with no education, no bank loans, my God, I can do it today. The train depot has been um, uh, a symbol of, of decay. Yeah. For now taking that over, mm -hmm. is that the right tenant oh. to make it now a symbol of this town's rebirth? I believe unequivocally. And if you can imagine, that was a gateway for those who came from the south especially to the north for that $5 an hour for this new opportunity, including my family. You know, we came on the train initially and then up to Flint. So all of these things are so symbolic at this time. And I hope and pray that there's a meaningful involvement of African-American people in the restoration and the rebuilding of that institution. You have a building named after you at Western Michigan University, uh, along with Dennis Archer and Ron Hall. Yes. Uh, that new dormitory there that celebrates all three of you as, yes. Uh, yes. as proud graduates. Yeah. Uh, just interviewed the president, the new president of Western Michigan University. Um, if you could send him a message uh, on what you want done with your alma mater, what would it be? Oh, I would say that we must, we must continue the legacy of attracting, retaining, and graduating our students. Retention is oftentimes a problem in today's universities. People have to work more, the students are heavy with debt, so you, rather than graduate in four or five years, sometimes it's six. But retention is critical, and that has become one of Dr. Montgomery's primary concerns. How do we graduate these young men and women once they get on this campus? As you watch what's happening in America, throughout the world, and the Trump administration, uh, if you could send a message to, uh, to Donald Trump, Republican, president of this country, as it relates to minorities in business, what would it be? Well, obviously, I think that we need to calm the rhetoric, uh, calm the Twitter. And I would say this, though, that our community has been here in other troubling times with unique leaders. Woodrow Wilson, an outstanding educator, president of Princeton, he went to Washington and resegregated the government. And yet we survived that. So I would say to all of us, this is a time to just stay focused, stay in prayer, and no matter who's in the White House, God is in every house. Dr. Ricard, thank you, it's a pleasure. Uh, good luck with all the activities coming up on this very, very special weekend for the city of Detroit. And best of luck on your new book and beyond. Thank you. All right, I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more Newsmakers in the Spotlight from theCUBE. Have a great week.